BBC Two's season of films made for television continues now with Lee Remick and Ralph Waite in a romantic comedy, A Good Sport. In half an hour, we begin a new documentary series, Byline. In the first programme, Robert Cheshire examines the impact of tourism in Turkey and discovers the hidden cost, disgruntled tourists and a peasant who's encountered tourist gold. Byline at 9.30 here on One. The 9 o'clock news from the BBC with Michael Burke and Philip Hayton. Mrs. Thatcher reshuffles her government. John Moore loses half his job. Health is handed over to Kenneth Clark. Tony Newton moves up into the cabinet. David Mellor moves sideways into the health department. The judge tells the Siemens Union, behave for three weeks and you'll get your funds back. The government pulls out of Britain's space plane project. Remand centres may go private to help our overcrowded prisons. And England's batting on its last legs. Even Alan Lamb couldn't save the day. Good evening. Mrs Thatcher has reshuffled 23 of her ministers tonight and effectively demoted the man once spoken of as her successor. John Moore, who's been in charge of the biggest government department, health and social security, has lost half his job. He remains in charge of social security but midway through his controversial review of the National Health Service, loses his responsibility for health to a new Secretary of State. He's Kenneth Clark, who's been promoted from number two at the Department of Trade and Industry. He'll take over the single issue on which the government has felt under most pressure from the opposition. His replacement is Tony Newton, who's deputised for Mr Moore at the Health Department and will now have a seat in the Cabinet. A trio of junior ministers move round Whitehall. David Mellor goes from the Foreign Office to the new Health Department. William Waldegrave into the Foreign Office from Environment. And he, in turn, will be replaced by John Selwyn Gummer, who moves over from Agriculture. Tonight's reshuffle took Westminster by surprise. Mrs Thatcher says she wants ministers to spend the long summer recess getting to know their new jobs. John Moore's removal at the climax of the Health Service Review is a reflection of how cruel a trade politics is. He was promoted to the cabinet. Some said over-promoted at only 48. Immediately, newspapers began to write of him as a future prime minister. That always puts rivals' backs up. When the health service crisis erupted last autumn, with ward closures and shortages of nurses that delayed children's life-saving operations, the political knives were out for John Moore. The opposition lambasted him, and Tory critics blamed him for not having fought his corner for more money at the Star Chamber. The Prime Minister scented political danger. One cabinet minister said, Thank heaven she's a constituency MP. Once she heard the complaints in Finchley, everything changed. John Moore tried to stay at work, suffering from a troublesome illness that grumbled on. He gave a couple of bad performances in the House. John's back is so hard against the wall that his elbows are penetrating the brickwork, said a colleague, with that sweet charity that makes politics so interesting. Tonight, Moore, faced with appalling problems over Social Security, looks like yet another ex-future Prime Minister. Kenneth Clark is the beneficiary of one of the Prime Minister's rare admissions that she was mistaken. Originally, she was against splitting the huge DHSS, because it seemed like tinkering with the Whitehall machine. But during the Health Service review, she decided that it would be safer if Clark concentrated on the NHS, while Moore administered what remains the largest budget in government, social services. Kenneth Clark's heart has always been in running the Health Service, a job he formerly had as Norman Fowler's deputy. Mrs Thatcher's selection of him as her new top man in this field confirms that the review will be more cautious than once seemed probable. Clark is a consolidator. He does not believe in radical changes or in tearing the NHS apart to see how it works, but in fiercer management to make sure that it runs more efficiently. Doctors in particular may find him a stern taskmaster, for he's been critical in the past of medical restrictive practices. Iran and Iraq have been fighting fiercely as moves towards the truth intensify. 
Iran has called up volunteers to repel last week's Iraqi advance, but Baghdad say they plan to withdraw tomorrow. On the diplomatic level, the foreign ministers of Iran and Iraq will have separate talks with the UN Secretary General in New York on Wednesday. UN observers are already trying to tackle the practical problems of drawing the ceasefire line, policing it and arranging for the release of prisoners of war. Tonight, President Reagan reaffirmed his willingness to talk any time, any place about the fate of the hostages, but would not negotiate for them. The UN Secretary General's announcement a week ago that he hoped to announce a ceasefire within 10 days was generally regarded then as being optimistic. Now his officials say the date may have slipped back a little, but the arrival in New York of the Iranian Foreign Minister, Ali Akbar Veliati, to be followed tomorrow by his opposite number from Iraq, is being seen as the best sign so far both governments want an end to the fighting. At this stage, though, the two sides aren't even agreed on precisely what form the talks should take or what ground they should cover. The Iraqis want to talk to the Iranians face to face. The Iranians still seem to prefer the idea of negotiating separately through Perez de Cuellar. And at present, that does seem the most likely format. Foreign Minister of Iraq proposed to direct uh, discussions and I invited them to come to discuss with me. And then the, 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 the foreign ministers are coming within the context of my invitation. If we want to test the Iranians' will to have real peace, one of the best ways we can uh, uh, gauge that is to see whether they will sit with us. If they don't sit with us, how are they going to sign a peace agreement with us? The UN Secretary General will be exercising all his diplomatic skills over the next 24 hours or so, getting the talks off the ground on Wednesday, first with the Iranians, then with the Iraqis. But he's still confident peace isn't very far away. This is Linda Lewis for the 9 o'clock news in New York. Iran may want peace, but it is still eager to show these pictures of support for the war and the send-off Iranian families are apparently giving to revolutionary guards as they prepare to go to the front. The reality is that Iranian military morale is low, but the Iraqis don't want to hold back, suspecting that this Iranian desire for martyrdom will re-emerge in a newer, stronger, re-equipped army. So both Iran and Iraq can say farewell to any immediate peace treaty, a truce perhaps. This picture of an Iranian victim of chemical warfare follows an Iraqi offensive last Friday. He is one of the hundreds of thousands of men injured in this eight-year war. That war had reached stalemate along the border, but on the central front between Khazri Sharin and Mehran, an offensive over the weekend left 1,500 square miles of Iranian territory in Iraqi hands. The Iraqis say they'll now pull back to the border, but will continue attacks on the Iranians until the ceasefire is agreed. This is Iraqi firepower. Baghdad is deeply distrustful of the Iranians and fears that they are merely stalling for time. In contrast, the now idle weaponry seized from the Iranians in many areas and the 8,000 men taken prisoner by the Iraqis over the weekend. In all, there are more than 60,000 prisoners of war on both sides and they could prove a stumbling block to any lasting peace. We know that an earlier stage the Iranians had converted some of these Iraqis to Islamic fundamentalist beliefs and there had been fights between prisoners of the two persuasions in, in Iran. And it may be that the Iraqis will not be satisfied with the number of prisoners who are returned to them and will claim that there are more who should come back. Tonight from Tehran, these first pictures of Ayatollah Khomeini since Iran declared its support for the UN peace resolution. In New York, the Iranians must now convince the Iraqis that their quest for a settlement is sincere. Here, a High Court judge has said the Siemens Union can regain control of its sequestered assets in three weeks' time, provided there are no further complaints of union involvement in the illegal picketing still going on against the P&O company in Dover. The judge, Mr Justice Michael Davis, also reprimanded a senior Dover policeman for defending the strikers' behaviour. Superintendent Graham Manford had said on the BBC's Newsnight programme that the dismissed men were demonstrating legally rather than picketing. Kent police apologised on his behalf for what the judge called a very serious error. The Siemens Union is allowed six pickets on the dock gate at Dover. 
but most mornings they're accompanied by 200 or so NUS demonstrators and they constitute an illegal mass picket. The NUS was told today it could have its sequestrated assets back but the union is effectively on trial for three weeks to see whether it really will disassociate itself from that mass picket. The NUS leader is worried. At any time during that three weeks, you know, you can go back into court and say that the union has not done what it was supposed to have done. And then uh, Justice Davis has said, well, he might hear it in September or it might even be October. I think it's a bit much. During the hearing, Mr Justice Michael Davies complained that the police were allowing the mass picket to continue. And he criticised comments by Superintendent Graham Mountford of Dover Police who said on last Friday's BBC Newsnight programme, I believe it is a right everyone should have to be allowed to demonstrate. The judge said that on a previous occasion, he suggested the police and pickets had a cosy relationship. Individuals were, he said, entitled to criticise decisions of the court, but the police had a duty to carry them out. Counsel for Kent Police denied there was a cosy relationship. No disrespect was meant, he said, and the words used by the superintendent were withdrawn. Kent police chiefs were called to the High Court and apologised. So the court's given the NUS the chance to retrieve its assets, but fines and sequestration have cost the union £1 million. The government is to stop funding research into Hotal, the project to develop a reusable space plane, which could reduce the cost of launching satellites. It says the cost of it is too high. But the government says it will support efforts by Rolls-Royce and British Aerospace to find international partners to back the project. It was designed as a revolutionary new space plane, launching satellites at a fraction of the cost of rockets. With its air-breathing engine, it would take off like an aeroplane and switch over to its own oxygen supply when it left the atmosphere. Now, it seems, Hotol may have been permanently grounded. Two years ago, the government provided three million pounds for British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce to find out if the concept would work. They concluded it would and wanted more money to develop the technology. Today, the government refused that extra money and urged the companies to seek partners abroad. Government critics see it as further evidence that Britain does not see much future in bold space projects. The government recently withdrew from the European shuttle known as Hermes and the big version of the Ariane rocket though Britain is still putting money into the Columbus space platform. Hotol would cost up to £6,000 million to develop. It could only be done with international collaboration, but without British government backing, it might be hard to convince foreign governments it's a worthwhile project. British Aerospace will now probably try to get Hotol off the secret list so it can talk more freely to potential industrial partners abroad. An IRA man has been shot dead in Northern Ireland, almost certainly by loyalists. Brendan Davison, who was 30 and single, was shot at his home in the Catholic markets area of Belfast. Meanwhile, security forces on both sides of the Irish border are still investigating the IRA bomb which killed three members of a family at the weekend. Three men that eyewitnesses said were wearing police-type uniforms fired about nine shots at Brendan Davison through the door of his home. He was hit in the head. The IRA later said he was one of their members. He was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment for attempted murder in the 1970s. He was also a member of Sinn Féin and survived an attempt on his life by loyalists last year. IRA members have died violently at the rate of one a month for the last two years. But since last November, the organisations killed 17 civilians in botched attacks. One part of the IRA top leadership, the General Headquarters staff, assesses operations. It seems certain that will recommend no more attacks which could result in civilian deaths. Even the IRA is worried, if only about the resulting unprecedented damage to its political wing, Sinn Féin. The latest attack to go wrong is the murder of three members of the Hanna family on Saturday near the border. The massive IRA bomb blew their Shogun Jeep off the road and right across the field beyond. This stretch of the Belfast to Dublin road is one of the most heavily watched along the border. There are army foot patrols, helicopter surveillance, and a string of watchtowers and lookout posts. Yet at almost exactly the same spot where the IRA murdered Lord Justice Maurice Gibson last year, the terrorists managed to place another huge bomb. The question for the security forces is, how did they do that under the eyes of the watchers?
The government wants to allow private companies to build and run remand centres for prisoners awaiting trial. It says bringing in private contractors, as in America, would help reduce prison overcrowding and make the remand system more cost-effective. But the government's critics say privatisation would do nothing to solve the basic problems of Britain's prisons. Prison overcrowding is now at such an intolerable level that even the government admit holding unconvicted prisoners, two and sometimes three to a cell, is totally unacceptable. They simply can't get new jails built quickly enough. And that's where they see private contractors coming in, not just to construct prisons more speedily, but to become involved in the running of new remand centres. The government also believe a private company could take over many of the escort duties, getting prisoners to and from the courts, thus releasing more policemen onto the streets and prison officers for more productive tasks inside. The Home Office must not be a stick in the mud department. We have to be open to new ideas. We mustn't be ashamed of admitting new ideas. Uh, and this is a set of new ideas which we're opening for discussion today to see what people make of them. Howard, very young, visit. Private prisons are already operating in parts of America. This one at Chattanooga in Tennessee is held up as a fine example of what can be achieved. But even here, the police once had to be called in to quell a riot. Tonight, the Prison Officers Association outlined their fears of what might happen here. We fear greatly that there will be uh, increased levels of, of uh, prisoners escaping from the system, that courts and escorts will become a vulnerable part of the penal system, and that in general terms, there will be a leveling down of the care and uh, the security that, and control which exists in the present system. The idea that by changing the management or ownership of prisons, is going to somehow end the pressure is patently nonsense. All it's going to do is temporarily give the illusion of activity. But despite those fears, a privatisation experiment now seems likely. And now back to the news of tonight's government reshuffle, which is centred on the creation of a new department for health. The Royal College of Nursing and the British Medical Association both said tonight they were pleased that health now merited a department of its own and was no longer combined with social security. The size of the cabinet has been increased to 22, the maximum legal limit. There are important changes for several ministers, but one of the most significant is for Tony Newton, in the cabinet for the first time. The biggest promotion goes to Tony Newton, who has been highly regarded as health minister and who many thought might take the top health job. Instead, he's going into the cabinet for the first time as number two to the Trade and Industry Secretary, Lord Young. Mr. Newton will take over Kenneth Clark's responsibilities for the inner cities. This move is seen as a way of broadening Mr. Newton's experience. And the same point is made to explain why two other up-and-coming ministers of state have changed jobs. David Mellor, who's been at the Foreign Office, is going to health, and William Walgrave at Environment is replacing him at the Foreign Office. Archie Hamilton, the Prime Minister's Parliamentary Private Secretary, gets his first major departmental job in the Ministry of Defence. He's taking over from Ian Stewart, who's moving sideways to the Northern Ireland office. John Gummer, the former Tory party chairman, still obviously in favour, goes from agriculture to environment. Eric Forth and Virginia Bottomley are joining the government as junior ministers. Mrs Bottomley will form a husband and wife team in government, the first for about 20 years. Her husband, Peter Bottomley, stays as Transport Minister. John Stanley, the Northern Ireland Minister, is among six ministers leaving the government. He's only 46, but he says he feels he's had a good innings. David Mitchell resigns from Transport, and family reasons are given for his departure. The Prime Minister decided last week not to wait until September, and instead to have the reshuffle this week. Mrs Thatcher wants to make sure that the big organisational change splitting the health and social security departments didn't get in the way of the health funding review. And she was anxious to avoid the weeks of speculation which usually precede the autumn changes. Today's decision will come as a relief to the many ministers, cabinet and otherwise, who felt they might be in danger. This ministerial team is now not expected to change until next year. And that means, apart from anything else, that suggestions that the Chancellor Nigel Lawson might be moving on can now be firmly discounted. The health authority in charge of the hospital which gave overdoses of radiation to cancer patients should have known that its equipment needed testing more often. 
according to the junior health minister, Edwina Curry. She told MPs the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital didn't appear to have followed in full the guidelines for the maintenance of equipment, although they're laid down in statutory regulations. For the first time since the Vietnamese invasion of Kampuchea almost 10 years ago, all the warring factions directly involved have met to discuss peace terms. Although there was no